Hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk about Jair Bolsonaro, the new president of Brazil as of the 1st of January 2019. I'm going to examine South American history to explain the real roots of his ideology, and in doing so, I'll introduce the concept of Latin American fascism. Here's a very short summary, just in case you happen to be unfamiliar with Bolsonaro. In the 70s, when Brazil was ruled by a right-wing military dictatorship, he voluntarily chose to join the army. After leaving, he became a far-right career politician. Before winning the election last year, he had spent almost three decades as a congressman, only having two pieces of his legislation passed in 27 years. Some of his finest moments include telling a fellow member of Congress that he wouldn't rape her because she doesn't deserve it, and proudly exclaiming into about a dozen press microphones that no one likes gay people. So yeah, pretty self-explanatory there. So, how does the international media talk about his politics? Well, let's take a look. Bolsonaro has restyled himself the Trump of the tropics. It's an election where the frontrunner has been compared to Donald Trump. The man who's been dubbed the Trump of the tropics. Meet Jair Bolsonaro, labelled the Trump of the tropics. So they pretty much just compare him to Donald Trump. And sure, based solely off those two clips that I just showed, for example, he does seem a lot like Trump, right? But there is actually a lot more to it, and I'm going to show you why. There is an innocent component to these simplistic comparisons with Trump. Everyone knows who Trump is, so it's a nice, easy way for the media to give the viewer, no matter who they might be, or where they might be from, a familiar reference point. But the problem with this is, these simplistic takes on Bolsonaro's politics are making him sound a lot less bad than he actually is. And that's saying a lot, because comparisons to Trump aren't exactly glowing endorsements. Bolsonaro actually takes his cues from an ideology that's distinctly Latin American, one that's far more dangerous than any comparison to Trump could aptly imply, Latin American fascism. Now you're probably wondering, Latin American fascism, what's that? And that's a very fair question because it's not exactly a common term, yet it's still probably planted an image in your head, right? The stereotypical Latin American military dictator who probably wears their uniform to bed, medals and all, and that image is somewhat accurate. There is, however, more to it. Federico Finchelstein, a renowned expert on fascism in Latin America, states that the right-wing dictatorships of the 70s and 80s in South America, especially those of Chile and Argentina, practiced a distinct type of fascism, inspired by more traditional forms of fascism, but nonetheless quite different from them. And Bolsonaro, despite being Brazilian, has been very open in his ideation of the methods used by these two dictatorships in particular. For example, in 2006, he bizarrely asked the Chilean embassy to relay a message from him to the grandson of Augusto Pinochet, the dictator in Chile from 1973 to 1990, in which he lamented the supposed leftist propaganda campaign against the memory of Pinochet and praised him as a great leader. Then, later, he openly praised Pinochet on TV. Chile, 73. Pinochet fez o que tinha que ser feito, por quê? Dentro do Chile existiam mais de 30 mil cubanos. So, what is it that characterizes Latin American fascism? Well, it's much more religious than traditional fascism, with the rallying cries being Judeo Christian values and Western values. Nuestra generación vive una crisis de identidad que se manifiesta en un permanente cuestionamiento de los valores tradicionales de nuestra cultura y asume, en muchos casos, Las concepciones nihilistas de la subversión antinacional. An internal enemy is then constructed that apparently wants to destroy these values. This internal enemy is associated with atheism, subversion, Marxism, etc., essentially meaning leftism in general. So basically, the evil leftist subversives want to destroy your religion, your family, etc., etc., everything good in the world. This so-called enemy is dehumanized, and effectively any kind of measure taken against anyone deemed to be said enemy is legitimized. The armed forces are thus turned against their own people, and this one-sided state terrorism is framed by its leaders as an existential war for the nation's very survival. Human rights are reframed as something that must be earned, rather than something that is a fundamental, and certain people are deemed unworthy of their protections. 
And, of course, while all of this is going on, the economy is liberalized and public services are decimated. The clearest examples of this, both of which Bolsonaro is strongly influenced by, were Argentina and Chile. In Argentina, from 1976 to 83, 30,000 people were murdered and countless more kidnapped, imprisoned, and tortured. In Chile, 3,000 people were murdered and 40,000 were imprisoned or tortured from 1973 to 1990. So, what does this have to do with Bolsonaro? I'm going to let him explain that in his own words. Eu, eu não, não confio na democracia brasileira. Isso que está aqui não é democracia, isso aqui é uma bagunça. Tanto é que a população diz abertamente que se vivia muito melhor no regime militar do que hoje. We have to fight against the ideological brainwashing of our children and the destruction of the family unit. Esses marginais vermelhos serão banidos de nossa pátria. Vamos unir o povo. Valorizar a família, respeitar as religiões e nossa tradição judaico-cristã. Combater a ideologia de gênero, conservando nossos valores. As you can see, Bolsonaro's discourse is essentially exactly the same. He identifies Judeo-Christian values, the family, etc. as things that are apparently under attack from an internal enemy, leftists, as a tradition, and he believes that they must be removed from the country by whatever means necessary. He's also adapted this for modern times, incorporating the dog whistle of so-called gender ideology, which is apparently also a threat to these traditional values. He's also adapted it to Brazil's specific situation, using its high crime rate to further justify the internal security doctrine and the idea that human rights are a privilege that can be revoked. Bolsonaro stated that the policy of human rights has to change. For humans' rights, but not for vagabonds and marginals who live at the cost of the government. Now, Bolsonaro is of course Brazilian, and Brazil of course had its own dictatorship. While he is a supporter of this dictatorship, he's nonetheless clearly expressed that he thinks it didn't go far enough, as in Argentina and Chile, and that doing so would be the only way forward for Brazil. So the rhetoric of the Brazilian dictatorship was very similar to the dictatorships from Argentina and Chile. For example, the coup that brought the Brazilian dictatorship to power was actually enabled by agitation from the religious right. But it was nonetheless different in its methods. It preferred repression, imprisonment, and torture to the extermination tactics that were used in Chile and Argentina. So Bolsonaro has clearly expressed his preference for the methods used in Chile and Argentina by overtly praising those dictatorships and contrasting them with the Brazilian dictatorship. Other times, he's actually made more subtle references, such as in this television interview from 1999. Pretty confronting, hey? So, the 30,000 figure that he threw out there might seem arbitrary at first, but 30,000 is the specific rounded number of people estimated killed by the dictatorship in Argentina, one that is very well known throughout the continent. Given the clear ideological similarities and Bolsonaro's demonstrated ideation of the dictatorships of this era in general, this seems to have been a nod of approval towards their methods, which he hopes to bring to Brazil. When I was living in Argentina, I had the privilege of attending a talk given by a survivor of that dictatorship. In 1976, when she was a 22-year-old university student, she was kidnapped, detained, and tortured for 105 days in the Puente Dulce concentration camp in Buenos Aires. She was only released because the file they had on her, by some stroke of luck, didn't have anything in it about her membership in leftist student groups. She said that in those years, an entire generation of potential future leftist politicians was targeted and systematically exterminated, and that this left a massive wound on the political landscape, with tens of thousands of potential future leftist politicians wiped out. And she's entirely correct, because you can clearly see the effect this had in Argentine politics today. There are very few politicians who were leftist activists during the dictatorship. In the clip, that's exactly the scenario that Bolsonaro hopes for. Kill 30,000 leftists as they did, for the same ends as they did. For him, the elimination of this internal enemy is the only way to ensure that Brazil's Western Judeo-Christian values will be upheld. And, of course, 
There's the economic similarities too. The free market shock treatment imposed in Chile and Argentina by the dictatorships is infamous, and Bolsonaro has expressed his clear intent to do the same. He's also appointed Paulo Guedes as his Minister of Economy. Guedes studied at the University of Chicago during the 70s. At that same time, his alumni, known as the Chicago Boys, were collaborating with the dictatorships in Chile and Argentina to introduce free market reforms. Later in the same decade, he taught classes in Chile, extolling the virtues of the same free market economics that Pinochet was forcing upon the country at the time. Bolsonaro has, somehow, found himself an authentic Chicago boy 40 years later. That's so ridiculously pertinent that it's almost impressive. So, all of this considered, Bolsonaro quite clearly fits the mold of the Latin American fascists. And this is a whole lot worse than, well, whatever Trump is. The big question is, what does this mean for Brazil? Well, firstly, while it is definitely worrying that so many people in Latin America's biggest country would vote for a literal fascist, nonetheless, Lula, who was president from 2003 to 2011, was by far the most popular candidate in every opinion poll until he was disqualified from being able to run by very questionable charges levied against him by Sergio Moro. Moro is the same judge who just months later, coincidentally, became Bolsonaro's Minister of Justice. This indicates that a substantial portion of the votes for Bolsonaro came from people who would have otherwise voted for Lula. This seems like quite a conundrum as they're obviously nothing alike. One is a leftist who is seriously concerned with social and economic justice, and the other is a literal fascist. The precise reason for this is anyone's guess, but I would say it has a lot to do with the media coverage. Bolsonaro was the face of the election circuit in Brazil. Whether the coverage was favourable or not, it nonetheless greatly increased its profile. So Bolsonaro would be the next choice for a lot of people who are just kind of voting for the biggest personalities they see. This is exacerbated by the fact that Bolsonaro's campaign was heavily boosted by the dissemination of fake news on social media, such as WhatsApp. So, a lot of the votes for Bolsonaro were probably less an endorsement of his methods and more of his big, highly visible personality that extols plenty of nationalistic sentiment, combined with his dirty campaign tactics. It's also important to remember that, while he did win the election with 55% of the vote, only 38% of the voting population actually voted for him. So that's 62% who were either opposed to him or not inspired enough to bother to head down to a ballot box on election day. So, I wouldn't say at all that the Brazilian people have endorsed fascism here. It is, nonetheless, a significant portion of the population. But it's probably not enough to implement his agenda without a fight. On that note, though, Brazil's Congress is currently controlled by the right wing. While few of them are quite as far to the right as Bolsonaro is, this still indicates a scary possibility. Bolsonaro may not even need a dictatorship he may be able to simply get the legislative votes that he needs to implement his criminal agenda democratically. Nevertheless, analysts are saying that the Congress is divided between so many parties that such a mandate is very unlikely. So, what about the military? What do they think? That is the million dollar question here. Bolsonaro is clearly very pro-military. His cabinet is absolutely packed with ex-military men. Eight of them, in fact, with three being former generals and one a former admiral. In an article for Foreign Policy magazine, Michael Albertus makes a convincing argument that the military is likely to cooperate with Bolsonaro rather than seize power directly. This seems like exactly the kind of arrangement that Bolsonaro seeks, and he's constantly expressed his willingness to effectively give the military a free pass to do whatever they might wish. The military were already deployed to Rio in the name of internal security last year under the previous president. They have been accused of a number of human rights abuses there, Brazil also still has military police forces that cover what are, in most other places, civilian policing duties. And its security forces in general are known for levels of brutality and abuse that are almost unfathomable. So the precedent for military involvement in civilian matters is already there, and it's ripe to be expanded if both sides cooperate. Of course, though, international pressure is a thing. The international community is very familiar with the methods of Latin American fascists. And aside from perhaps the United States, they're unlikely to tolerate such a regime. Additionally, Bolsonaro has shown a clear concern for his international prestige, recently appearing at the World Economic Forum Summit in Davos. So, such foreign pressure might stop Bolsonaro from realising the full extent of his agenda. Regardless, history shows us that the South American dictatorships of the second half of the 20th century were very good at concealing and denying their crimes. This is especially relevant in Brazil. 
where the military and the police force are already quite out of control and barely ever held accountable for their crimes. It would hardly be very difficult for them to incorporate more human rights abuses into their prison operations while hiding it from the outside world. All in all, I would say that it's not looking very good at all. Bolsonaro is an adherent of what is clearly a very dangerous ideology that could easily get out of hand with support from the military. And that support seems likely, unfortunately. Giving even more power and discretion to the already out of control military and police is a recipe for human rights disaster. Brazil looks set to undergo much hardship and perhaps even descend into chaos. But I still find it difficult to accept the potential fall of the world's four flags democracy. Even though everything I'm seeing just says otherwise. I guess like many Chileans who watched the collapse of democracy back in 1973, I simply don't want to believe that this is happening. Regardless, it is very important that we understand Bolsonaro and Latin American fascism. Brazilians need our solidarity right now, more than ever. Being informed is an important prerequisite if we're to provide them with it and contribute whatever little we can to make sure history doesn't repeat itself. Additionally, Bolsonaro's success likely means that similar ideologues will be inspired elsewhere. When they pop up, it's imperative that they're called out for what they really are and that apt, historically informed comparisons are made rather than clickbait like the insert country name here, Trump. Nunca mas y nunca mais. That brings me to the end of this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you've learned something, and as always, all the sources cited can be found in the description. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing, liking, following me on Twitter at badempanada, commenting, etc. And if you've got any questions, feel free to ask, I'll be happy to answer.